This, this talk is going to look at genotype imputation, which is a standard technique. We'll cover uh, just an overview of it, and we'll look at some of the models used, which then in the research talk that I'll have on Thursday, we'll make use of some of the information in the tutorial. And I'll f finish up with maybe a little bit discussion of programming, because that's something that's very relevant to this audience. So imputation is just uh, estimating missing data. You can use the other data in the, the data set you have and external data sets. And if you have played any word games, you've, you've done imputation. The classic example is hangman. Start, you give three characters, the last two characters are AT. About a third of the letters in the alphabet can fit in there. And Hangman gives a good illustration of, of a general principle of imputation that the more context you have, the better you can fill in or estimate that missing data. If I give you some additional characters that, for the sentence, the dog chased the, you can do a much better job filling it in. Instead of a third of the characters in the alphabet, there's one, a C, probably springs to mind first. It could also be an R. But your probability distribution becomes much more pointed. Genotype imputation is the filling in of genotypes. So it originally started where you actually were imputing genotypes. Now, for computational reasons, we work on the haplotype and imputing alleles level. So your reference data consists of reference haplotypes, two phase reference haplotypes per reference sample. And the sample you're imputing has two haplotypes too, but it's missing a lot of data. It typically is genotyped on a SNP array, and you have just a couple of uh, just to get back there. You know, you might have a marker here where on one haplotype there's a G and a marker here where the other haplotype there's a C, and on the second haplotype for the sample, an A and a C. And based on these reference samples, yours and a probabilistic model, you want to make inferences about what all these dots, ah, there it goes again, what all these dots are. So imputation has been around for a long time. Imputation of sporadic missing genotypes has been around for a long time, but imputation came into prominence in 2007, where a group from uh, Oxford with the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium and sort of simultaneously a group in Michigan, Gonzalo Abacasis's group, developed methods for imputing ungenotyped markers using reference data. And the initial application was defining new trait associated loci. And it, in the initial study, it actually didn't produce much, although it will produce some power. The idea is that you have a SNP ray in which you've genotyped 300,000, 500,000, a million markers. But there's a lot of other markers in the genome. If you can impute them, then you can test additional markers. So it should give you a little bit increase in power, and it, and it will. Uh, the second application was for fine mapping. So you, your genotype markers show that you have an association in a region, but there may be other markers that weren't genotyped that give you a stronger signal, and that can be valuable for replication studies. So you impute the additional markers in the region. You might find a marker that's more highly correlated with the trait you're interested in. And then that's the marker that you'd want to take forward, definitely include in your replication uh, study, because it will, should have a greater chance of replicating the association if it's real. These first two applications are nice. I don't think they're necessarily game changers. They're, they're useful, very useful, but the real killer application is meta-analysis. So there's lots of different SNP arrays out there with different numbers of markers by different vendors. SNP arrays from different vendors tend to not have a lot of overlap. And when you want to do meta-analysis, it's very difficult to do meta-analysis when your data sets are genotyped on different markers. It's like this Gordian knot. Well, imputation just slices through that knot. You take a reference panel, you impute all your data, individual data sets so that they all have the same markers that are in the reference panel, and now they're on the same set of markers, and you proceed. So that's been very valuable when you see these studies in nature, nature genetics, where they have several hundred thousand samples, and they have scores and scores of associations. It's imputation that made that work, work in a straightforward way. Because they, there's a lot of different data sets, and they had to use imputation to get them all in the same marker sets to do the meta-analysis. So the meta-analysis, I think, has, has been very, very successful. What you get out of imputation is not necessarily like hangman, where you, you, you're guessing the most, what you think is the most likely letter. 
it's probable, uh, a probabilistic output. So we think based on the reference data and the observed data in the sample that on this, this allele of this haplotype, there's a certain probability that the allele is the A allele or a certain probability that it's the B allele. So th throughout this talk, all these methods extend to multi-allelic markers, but for s just to remove that complexity, we'll assume as diallelic markers, and I'll typically refer to the alleles as A and B. My background is with human data, so whenever I refer to some physical uh, characteristics of data, I'll, be usually I'll always be thinking of human data. So my apologies to people from an animal background. It's just that's not my background, so I, my examples are from the human domain. So here's a haplotype at a marker. You might have for the A allele probability 98%, probability B allele 2%. And on the other haplotype, you also have a probability distribution. That essentially gives you all the information you need for whatever you want to, to use. The advantage of probabilistic output is you're capturing the uncertainty in the imputation rather than hard genotype calls where you've, you've erased that uncertainty. Uh, you can get called genotypes if you want by just taking the genotype that was have the highest probability and, and to get posterior probabilities at the genotype level rather than the allele level, you, just, you can assume Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and it pops out. Also with probabilistic gene types, you can use them in the standard, standard frameworks for testing. So if you do linear regression analysis, often typically the predictor at a marker is the number of copies of the minor allele, zero, one, or two. That same framework works with imputed data. It's just instead of an integer number of copies, you have the expected number of copies, which is sometimes referred to as the expected dose of the allele. So like uh, in this example, the B allele dose turns out to be 0.88. That's what you'd plug into your, your regression analysis. So there's more uncertainty in imputation. You need a way of measuring it. And there's two sort of ways. One, I think, is really obvious. One is a little less so. Uh, so the, the most obvious way is just genotype discordance. The little less obvious way is the correlation in allele dosage. And this was, I think, Again, the first groups that were developing imputation devised these methods, the Michigan group and, and the Oxford group devised something similar. Michigan devised the correlation metrics I'll talk about here. So R squared turns out, even though it's a little bit more complicated, has some advantages. A big advantage is it's normalized for allele frequency. So for example, if I tell you I have a marker that I can impute the alleles at this marker with 99.9% .9 accuracy. Well, it's very tough to interpret that without some more information. If, if the marker allele frequency is 30, 40, 50%, 99.9% .9 accuracy is really, really good. If the marker allele frequency is 0.1%, 99.9% accuracy is really, really, really bad, right? Because you could take and just do the, the dumb imputation strategy of always imputing the alleles to be the major allele. You've destroyed all the information at the marker, and you've achieved 99.9% .9 accuracy. So you have to know the allele frequency. Whereas correlation automatically builds it in. If you've, you know, from your introductory statistics class, if you computed a correlation, there's variances in the denominator. Those variances are in terms of capture the allele frequency. So it's, it can be interpreted in a much better way without actually knowing, having to know the allele frequency. The squared correlation met, met, uh, metric where you're looking at the expected correlation between the imputed allele dose, the imputed number of copies of alleles in samples, and the true number of copies of alleles in samples. It also has a couple other factors that strike me as not very obvious, but they're useful. So R squared can be estimated if the true genotypes are unknown. You can get an estimate of your accuracy without even knowing what the truth is. Now it assumes that your posterior genotype probabilities are well calibrated. So there is that assumption built in. But if they are, you can estimate the, from, from the imputed data itself without knowing the truth, you can estimate what that correlation is. This, was, uh, this idea was developed by Michigan. And a, der a derivation of something similar that illustrates one way to derive this is given in, in the reference I've cited in the American Journal of Human Genetics. This, the second. Uh, surprising feature is that R squared gives information about relative power. So there's an interpretation in terms of power that's, that's useful for R squared. So it turns out that the allelic test has similar power 
if you use imputed genotypes for n samples or the true genotypes for r squared times n samples. This uh, has been something similar to this has been known for a long, long time. The best explanation I've seen in this is a box in the American Journal article that I've cited here. If you want to look it up, it's just a small box that, that goes through the derivation. So if you're looking at a marker that you imputed where the estimated r square, which you're taking to be the true r square, and it, to be, is 0.8, and you have 1,000 uh, total samples, maybe half cases and half controls, if you test that imputed marker, the power should be roughly the same as using the true genotypes, which are correct, for 80% of your samples, for 800 samples. So it gives a way of, if you're trying to determine what R-squared threshold to use for accepting your imputed genotypes, to use, uh, to carry forward that imputed marker into downstream analysis, this gives you a way to interpret what that R-squared, what it might mean. So, so the general rule with imputation is you can impute high frequency markers really well and low frequency markers not very well. Where's the cutoff? What determines the threshold of what you can impute? There's two primary factors, one of which we can change and one we can't. The one we can't change is the effect of population size. We're stuck with that. The more diverse the population has, the bigger effective population size, uh, the the shorter the shared haplotype segments in the population and the shorter those ha shared haplotype segments are, the harder it is to impute. Can't change that. But what we can change, if given money, is the reference panel size. The more, the bigger the reference panel size, the lower frequencies we can impute. And we often think in terms of minor allele frequency, and for many applications that's more natural. But for imputation, the thing I find useful to think about is minor allele count. Oops, just a second. So this is the same data. This is, and it also, these plots are sort of nice for getting a sense of the potential for what imputation accuracy can be for different frequencies. This is simulated data from a Northwest European population. Reference panel sizes vary from 50 to 200,000 samples. And the target data is, is on a million SNP chip. On the left-hand plot, plot, we're plotting the squared correlation. This is using the true simulated, the truth versus the imputed data for different minor allele frequencies. On the right-hand plot, it's the same data, but broken up by minor allele count. On the left-hand side, you can see that the, you really need to know the frequency of what you're imputing to understand the accuracy. On the right-hand side, when it's expressed in terms of minor allele count, it's much more, much more stable. So you, with this simulated data, around 10 markers, uh, 10 copies of the minor allele in the reference panel, you sh you're getting up squared correlation accuracy around 0.7. For around 20 markers in the reference panel, 20, 20 variants in the reference panel, for a, at that level, you're getting around 80% imputation accuracy. So this, this is simulated data. It's going to be a bit better than current reference panels because current reference panels are predominantly if not totally, but or at least predominantly from low coverage sequence data. And low coverage sequence data, its Achilles heel is estimating low, low frequency genotypes. So it has a very high error rate for low frequency genotypes. But as we move into high coverage reference, reference panels obtained from high coverage sequencing, this kind of performance is, should be practical in outbred populations like European populations. Oh, one other inference from this is that as you double the reference panel size, if you were able to impute tw markers with at least 20 copies of the minor allele with a certain reference panel size, when you double it, that should still be true. It'll even get a teeny bit better. So every time you double the reference panel size, the frequency of variance that you can impute, other things being equal, cuts in half. It's sort of a linear relationship. Now, if you're from a sequencing background, a natural question to ask is why impute when you can sequence? Imputation has error. Sequencing is more accurate. High coverage sequencing, why, why go to the trouble of imputing? And so I, this slide just sort of breaks down the pros and, or the things that imputation is competitive with high coverage sequencing at and things that it's not competitive with. So the easiest thing to do is, is estimating allele frequencies. 
And that's what we do when we do association testing, which is where imputation has been used most widely. That's its strong point. So with 50,000 Northwest European reference samples, if you impute down to 20 copies, that's imputing down to a minor allele frequency of 10, uh, or 2 times 10 to the minus fourth. So you can go very, very relatively low and, and do very well with imputation if your goal is to estimate minor allele frequencies. If your goal is a little bit harder, it's much harder to estimate a genotype than to estimate a minor allele <coughs> frequency. Then it gets more problematic. In my simulated data, for 5% minor allele frequency and above, does, it does very good. It can, you can actually estimate the, the genotype with about 99.9% accuracy in that range. But it's not true for less than 5%. The accuracy slips and the imputation at a genotype level, not a minor allele frequency level, but a genotype level is just not as accurate. Now we could improve that by going to ever larger reference panels, but there is, there is a break, and it's much higher than the break for, for estimating allele frequency. There's a much higher break for estimating genotypes threshold. And of course, for de novo mutations, I don't care how you know, big your reference panel is, you aren't going to be able to impute them. So there's, it's true, there are things that genotype, imputa or genotype sequencing does much better than imputation, so why would you do it? Money, all right. High coverage, high coverage sequencing, thousand dollars. If, or at least that's the last time I checked. I think it's still in that range, um, and that that may even require an order in bulk. Um, I'm curious if somebody has data on that. I'd like to hear that. What the current costs are for uh, genotyping as a service? Chip typing. If you a good negotiator, you can get a pretty good deal on chip typing. You need you know big data sets. You need to play. Affymetrics off against Illumina and you know get them to go you know going against each other, but you can get it down to fifty dollars a, a sample. Imputation with the current methods, uh, you know half a cent a genome for ten thousand reference samples, and these are order magnitude figures. Five cents a genome for a hundred thousand reference samples, and if you have a million reference samples, which we won't for a few a few years probably, fifty cents fifty cents a sample. So essentially a hundredfold less than the chip typing cost. And there's a lot of data out there with chip typing costs or with, with GWAS chip data available. So compared to sequencing, then the, the cost difference is a factor of 2,000. You may not have $1,000 to sequence a sample, but you probably have five cents, right? So yeah, there's a trade-off. Depending on what your application is, if you're pro especially if you're interested in association testing, imputation gives you a lot of bang for the buck. So the next part of the talk is I'd like to go over the models, the, a standard model, the most widely used model for imputation. There's been some very nice, clever work developing other approaches, uh, matrix completion approaches, summary statistic approaches. Old, just you know, in the interest of summarizing, I'm going to talk about the one I'm most familiar with and also the one that, from what I've seen, has the greatest accuracy. Um, so the, the, ba the basic methods are based on hidden Markov models where you have a Markov process and you can't observe the underlying states of the process. It's hidden. But what you do have is observed data. And I'll go through the parts of the model and then we'll use this model in the research talk on Thursday. So I'll describe the Lee and Stevens model. Once the field of imputation moved into a, what's been called pre-phasing as we're imputing onto haplotypes, the Lee and Stevens model becomes the model, in my view, becomes the model of choice because it's computationally tractable at the haplotype level without having to do a lot of uh, shortcuts. You can do the full Lee and Stevens model and it gives you very accurate results. The reference for that seminal model is, is given on the slide. So the hidden Markov model has a number of components and I'll go through those components and all of them will typically be based on a slide like this so I'll go over that in some detail. So the first thing it has is model states. And there's going to, going to be a model state for every, ha every pairing of a haplotype and marker. So the, the markers, these are the, on the reference haplotypes, are given as columns of the matrix. The haplotypes, these are reference haplotypes, not the haplotypes you're imputing, but the, from the reference samples are given here. 
We'll label these H1, H2, H3, H4, and so on. The states of the model then just becomes the elements of the matrix, these circles. And for reasons that will become apparent in a slide or two, we want to label those states with the allele that the reference haplotype carries. So we'll, we'll use two. The blue allele will represent the reference allele. The yellow coloring will represent the alternative of allele. So the number of states in your model is just going to be the number of rows times columns. So it's number of haplotypes times the number of markers. The next component of the model after you've defined the states for the Lee, this is the Lee and Stevens hidden Markov model is the initial state probabilities. So these are the probabilities before you've seen any observed data. And the way the model, the process, the Markov process works is you start at the first marker and you work your way through to the last marker. So the initial state probabilities are, there's only non-zero probabilities in the first column for the first marker. So all those, for each haplotype, all the states at the first marker, they will have equal probability so that the probability sum to one. There's no reason to prefer one state to the other. And at every other marker, another, every other column, those states have probability zero at the, be at the beginning. Then there's state transitions. And just to keep the slide from getting too cluttered, I've only shown one. So far, the state transitions I've been shown is just what you can think is, is the primary state transition. So the primary straight, straight transition just goes, when you go from one marker to the next, you stay on the same haplotype. With probability close to one, that's what happens. But actually, it's, it's a little bit more flexible and complex. With a small probability, you can jump to a random haplotype. And that's what I've tried to show for just sing, one single marker right here. So with a, with a with a probability close to one, you stay on the same state, and there's no what we call no recombination. With a probability, a small probability, the remaining probability, you jump to a random state, and that random state can also include the, the state you're on. So what that is modeling is, is historical recombination, where in the past there's, you know, for a while you've inherited the same, the, hap the haplotype you're imputing on matches or is, has inherited the same sequence of genotyped alleles as on, as on a certain reference haplotype. And then it, because of a historical recombination, it switches to another reference haplotype. So these, the probability of that small probability of, of transitioning to a random haplotype is proportional over short distance, is approximately proportional to genetic distance. So the bigger genetic distance, the rate, higher recombination rate, and so you have a greater probability of, of transitioning to a random haplotype. So I won't show this anymore, but just be aware that the actual state transitions can go from to any marker at the, or any state at the next marker. But I'm only going to show the primary ones where you stay on the same haplotype. All right, the next component of the hidden Markov model is you have to have some way of relating your observed data to, the, to the, the Markov process. And that comes from what are called emission probabilities. And this is where the labeling, where we labeled each, each reference haplotype at each, each state with the allele that the reference haplotype carries. And so if you're in a particular state, let's just take the first state marker at the first haplotype, it will, with probability near one, emit the blue allele. And that's shown in these equations here. So if you're in a blue state, the square, this, I use a square to represent the allele on the observed data. It will be epsilon, here's a small value, it'll be close to one. With a small probability, it will emit the other state. You'll have a mismatch between your observed data and the, the state you're in. And the same principle holds for yellow. If you're in the yellow, you'll emit a yellow allele with high probability. With small probability, you'll emit the other allele. This works at, at any state where you have observed data. These open squares mean you have missing data like you would have if you were performing genotype imputation. Then here's another marker that's genotyped in your sample you're imputing. And so, for example, not knowing anything else, you'd just intuitively expect it's more likely you'd be in a state on haplotype 4, 1, or 2 because the emission probabilities are higher there because the allele matches than in states H3 and H5. 
the states where you have missing data, there the emission terms, they're, they're constant. Doesn't matter what the underlying state is, you have no observed data and you can treat it, treat it as one and it, and it drops out. Uh, let me let me back up. Once once you have the state probabilities, you can get the imputed allele probabilities. So the key the key thing you're trying to understand is given this imputed data, at a particular marker at any imputed marker. I'm sorry, given the observed haplotype, the the, ob the observed alleles on that haplotype, you want to understand what at each of these hidden states what its probability is. Once you have that, you're essentially done with the imputation problem. If you want to know what the probability of the blue allele at the third marker, once you have these state probabilities, you just add up all the state probabilities for, for, blue hapli for the blue states. And that gives you the probability, posterior probability, of the blue allele. Posterior probability of the yellow allele at the third marker, the probability that that's yellow, you just add up the state probabilities for all the uh, s states for reference haplotypes where the reference haplotype carries the yellow allele. So the key is those state probabilities, and that's the next slide. So this standard way of breaking this up, uh, it's, it's a really beautiful math. I, lo I love the math that, that you use to get these state probabilities, is you break it up in what's called a forward probability and a backward probability. So first, this is the state probability because little m is a marker, h is your haplotype, so it's the probability of being in the state at marker m, haplotype h, and the o is your observed alleles. Capital M is the total number of markers. So given all the observed alleles at, at the genotype markers, you want to be able to compute conditional on that what the state probability is. And from what we talked about in the last slide, as soon as you know the state probabilities, you just sum them up to get your imputed allele probabilities. So you break it up using the ind conditional independence assumptions into two parts that are called a forward and a backward probability. So there's a couple things to, to I think, to note about this equation. One is there's a forward probability for every state in your model. So remember there's number of states is the number of rows times columns, number of haplotypes times the number of markers. So there's a forward probability for each of those states and there's a backward probability for each of those states, for each marker and for each haplotype. The forward probability only, only includes the observed data up through marker M. So if you're imputing a forward probability for a state at marker M, the forward probability only includes the observed data up through marker M. The backward probability includes the observed data from the next marker all the way to the end. So there's that kind of division going on. And then, let's see. Then the name forward probability, I'm guessing it comes from the way they're computed. It turns out you would compute the forward probabilities by making a forward pass through your data. So. The way it works is you start with the state probabilities for marker one, which you get just from the initial state probabilities. They're all equal. Given your state probabilities for marker one, there's an update equation, which I'll, I'll just flash on the screen in, in, a, in a few minutes. There's an update equation that gives you all the state probabilities at marker two. Once you have all the state probabilities at marker two, there's an update equation that uses these probabilities to determine all the state markers at all the state probabilities at marker three, and you just march through your data one marker at a time. And at each step, you use the state probabilities at the preceding marker to give you the, 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 forward, the forward probabilities at the next marker. I said state probabilities, but use the, I mean the forward probabilities at the preceding marker. And you keep marching. As you might guess, the backward probabilities work the same way, it's just in reverse. You start at capital M, the, the last marker in your data set, you start with the backward probabilities there, which are, which, which turn out to be all one initially. And then from that, you get the backward state probabilities at markers, at marker M minus one, at the preceding marker. And you keep marching backwards. So you end up at, eventually you get to marker six, and given the backward probabilities at marker six, you can get them at marker five. Given all the backward probabilities at marker five, the, the backward update equation 
gives you a marker four and so on, and you march back. So you do a forward pass and a backward pass through the data, and it's imaginatively called the algorithm the forward-backward algorithm. We'll use this equation in, in the research talk, and I just wanted to give a high-level look at the equation. This is an example of the forward update equation. Don't have to memorize it, but just to understand the different components of it. So remember, the up, forward update equation gives you the forward probabilities at marker m plus 1 given the forward probabilities at marker m. So that, oops, forward probabilities at marker m plus 1, that's the forward probabilities at marker m plus 1. You'll notice there's an m plus 1 there. Then you sum over all the reference haplotypes, all the states at marker m. So here is the forward probability at marker m. And then you end up multiplying that by a transition probability. So this is a state probability of being an H reference, the state for uh, reference haplotype H prime, and transitioning to the state at the next marker with reference to haplotype H. And then you multiply by an emission probability. So given this, the state you're in, what's the probability of the observed allele at that state? The backward state update, I won't go over. It has the same format. It's a little bit different, but it's the same format. You're summing over a, a, a triple product, product of the, the backward state probability at the, at the state you're coming from, a transition probability, and an emission probability. One thing that we'll use in the research talk on Thursday is we'll use very strongly the fact that when you're at an imputed marker, this term effectively drops out. And, that's, and we'll use that to, to find some faster ways to compute, compute uh, imputation. So the last part of the talk, I wanted to talk about programming. This is, for people with a CS background, this, this, some of this, a lot of this, all of this perhaps you've seen, but there's probably people in here that are like I was uh, a number of years ago coming into computational genetics with little or no programming background. And so there's certain, certain things that I th thought that it might be helpful to just go over that may save you some time, save you some, may, make your life a little simpler. Because a lot of our, our work is involved writing code. So I, I find when, when writing software that the chief ta challenge for me is complexity. If, and when it gets more complex, my mind has a hard time grasping it. I'm more error prone. And as much as if you're like me, you get a buzz from getting writing really fast code. It's, it's pretty exciting to write code that's really fast. That's really not the first object. The first object is to write clean, simple code. Don't worry about the optimization. You're, you're just trying to write the simple code so that when you look at it, it's easy to understand what it does. It, it operates in a logical way. The structure of it makes sense. Just easy for the mind to absorb and grasp without having to really study it. There is a place for optimization, but it's not the first thing you want to do. There's a famous quote that it started. Donald Knuth took this, this statement from scripture and then changed it <laughs> for computer science. He wrote, the premature optimization is the root of all evil. And I think the idea is that if you optimize too soon, you can end up optimizing the wrong thing or doing unnecessary optimizations that don't actually improve the code. Or if your code isn't simple to begin with, you have a hard time finding the right optimizations. See, optimiza optimization is not free. Yes, it can speed things up, but it has a cost. If your simple code was fast enough, you wouldn't need to optimize. So when you optimize, by definition, you are introducing complexity. And that complexity has, has costs. It's, you're going to have more bugs in it because it's more complex. It's going to be harder to find the bugs because it's more complex. It's going to be harder to extend your code, to add new features to it because it's more complex. It's going to be harder uh, to maintain the code because it's more complex. It's harder for other people to come look at your code and under, wonder what you're doing because it's more complex. So, there's that cost, and you have to weigh that cost against the expected benefit. Is a big increase in complexity worth getting a 5% reduction in runtime? In most cases, not. If your code is fast enough for practical purposes, getting a tenfold, hundredfold 
reduction in runtime may not may not be worth it for the increased complexity if it's already fast enough for your purposes, if it runs in a second. So weigh it up and, and understand how much complexity you're adding and what the trade-off is before you even add it. Because optimization is not, it's just not free. The second general principle that I find useful is modularity, which just carries the idea that the um, you want code, units of code where the input is very simple. What it does is simple to understand, at least at a high level, and the output's very simple. A module of code that you can treat conceptually as a unit without having to really think about it very deeply. Now, when you write the code, you may have to think about it de deeply, but once it's working and doing what you want, you can just treat it as a building block. And ideally, you want your program to be very loosely interacting modules so that when you're, when you're working on a particular module, because it operates very independently, you can give it that your whole concentration. You don't have to have the whole program, the whole complex program at your fingertips in your memory. You can just focus on the individual part you're working at because it's loosely coupled. The classic example of this would be uh, Unix utilities at the command line if you've used a Unix system. So Unix utilities, there's utilities for sorting, counting lines, counting words, extracting columns, uh, extracting lines that meet a certain criteria, changing characters, replacing words. In your, there's all these Unix utilities. And you can do a lot of your programming without actually, or a lot of your data manipulation without actually sitting and writing code. You just take the Unix utilities and you string them together in a series of filters or in a pipeline. Right? You, Unix utilities are a classic example of doing some units of code that do one thing, do it fairly well, and that you can work with as a unit without understanding how they're implemented. And that kind of approach is really useful for writing complex projects. Another just general thing when you're writing is if you can be aware when your classes or your methods, or which are called functions depending on language you're working in, when they do too much. One of the pieces of advice I read early on when I was learning program is beware of, of functions that extend more than the length of, of your computer screen. And in my experience, that's, that's good advice. When it doesn't fit on the screen, I'm more likely to make errors because I can't see the whole function without scrolling. And the extra length indicates it's usually a bit extra, com has additional complexity. And so, you know, all rules have exceptions, but I generally, if the function extends more than the screen, I want to see if there's a, a way to make the code cleaner, simpler, easier to understand by breaking it up into parts. Classes, if you work in an object-oriented environment, which for complex problems can be very useful, complex programs. For me, you know, your threshold may be different, but my threshold is once my, my file, my, I work in Java predominantly, once it's more than two or 300 lines, I notice that I have a harder time really understanding what's going on in the class. And so when it gets long, I, if I can, I try to find ways, see if there's a way I can break things up that would make it simpler to understand. There's not always, but I, I try. <coughs> so to get that simple code, it involves what's called refactoring, which is just cleaning up, cleaning up your code without changing how it behaves. So when do, you, when do you factor? How do you know what parts of the code you want to spend some effort cleaning up? Uh, just from experience, anything I've just written is going to need cleaned up. I never get a, a really right design the first time, unless it's a, just a trivial piece of code. I may not realize it when I write it that it has problems, but there's an acid test for, for discovering you have code that's hard to understand. It's, you just come back to it after a couple months. And for some reason, you have to go back into the code and and you're looking at it, and it's very humbling because you can't understand what you wrote. You wonder what you were thinking. Why did I do this? Is this a bug? Isn't this more convoluted than doing it this other way? All those thoughts that when you look at the code for fresh eyes, it's usually then that, that I spend time refactoring. When I first write the code, I'm just a little too close for it. I'm a little, it's hard for me to see the blemishes. But you come at it with fresh eyes, they're really obvious. And it's often in the part of that painful, 
time you're spending trying to understand what your code's doing again. That also can, at the same time, it's very easy to see ways that, oh, I could have done this differently. I could have combined things. I could have changed the organization to make it easier to structure. I could divide long methods into, into these two shorter methods. I can combine code that's essentially duplicate code so that instead of having to maintain two components of code, it's just one. So all those things become obvious when you look at the code again with fresh eyes. So refactoring, if you've had the experience like, you know, I've had many, many times of just having a, a not very fun day trying to understand what you wrote in the past, refactoring just makes it, means the next time you look at the code, it won't be so bad. And, it'll, and, and any poor soul that's not you, if you have a hard time understanding your code, just imagine what somebody else <laughs> coming at your code is going to, what difficulties they'll have. Then for testing and debugging, one tool that I find really useful is regression testing. So this is not linear regression from statistics. It's just testing to make sure your code is still working correctly. And this can be set up in a very automated way. You have some test data sets. The test data sets you originally used to convince yourself that your code was, was behaving well and doing what it was supposed to do. Save those test data sets, write some scripts, and save the output that you had from a previous version. And when you continue working on your code, maybe doing refactoring, and then reach a, reach a sort of a, a stable point in the code, you can check and see whether your code is still producing the same output. You can check at a qualitative level to see if it's still producing the same accuracy. You can also just use the diff tool in Unix to check whether the output files have changed at all. And this is a fantastic way to catch bugs that you've introduced. You had working code, you made some changes, and you didn't realize it, but you broke something. It makes it very systematic, very easy to, to find those type of bugs. Another useful uh, tool is version control system. I use a tool called Git. It allows you to go back and see previous states, your previous state of the program. You may have started off on a develop, line of development and then found out that this, I, I made a mistake, I need to backtrack. Or maybe there's a bug that you never caught before and it was introduced in the past. It allows you to essentially do a binary search to find just the point where you made the bug and determine exactly what changes that you made at that point. So you can very, with a microscope, nail down the, the place where the bug was introduced. If you use Git, there's a lot of tools online for that. There's a, a Udacity course on Git, that, a short Udacity course. There's also if, uh, some manual online. If you search for something called Git, G-I-T book, you should find the, the online book for, that explains Git if you want to learn it. It's not easy to learn Git initially, I don't think. Uh, these version control systems take a little bit of use, but they're a powerful tool once you learn them. It's like the Unix, the Unix environment. It's hard, hard to learn, but very powerful. The last is it pays to remember your previous bugs. Bugs are not uniformly distributed in your code, typically. They tend to cluster. And the reasons for that are you know, fairly, uh, fairly natural. It could be a complex section of code. Complex code, more likely to harbor bugs. They, they're spatially correlated in your, in your code. Could be something in your life you, where you weren't at your best the day you wrote that code. You didn't get enough sleep, you got a letter from the IRS, whatever. You, just something that threw you a little bit where you're not up to, up to your full, full capabilities. So if it pays to remember where your past bugs are, when you find a bug, if you can remember the type of bugs you had and, and where they tended to occur in the code in the past, that can help, you can give a little more preference to those parts of the code when you're trying to track that bug down and it can save you a lot of time. So thank you, thank you for your attention. That's uh, the the end of my my remarks. Do do we? Yep.